Well okay, folks, what I want to do today is first of all have a little bit of a think about the posters and the score grades that you've all now seen you've got. Uh, sorry about the little hiccup yesterday for those who just submitted PNGs. I, I didn't realise that they were actually submitted and there's something I could mark uh, or attach a mark to, but sorted that out. First of all, the first thing to say is actually the results were really pretty impressive. But there was something that was interesting. And in essence, the point about the marks from here, from the sort of 65% or the 69 band and downwards, is the fact that those, whether they're red or blue, were posters which hadn't really got to grips with the question properly, which was, if you remember, big data-driven, uh, analytics-driven decision-making, and then those questions of blah, 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 blah. And most of the ones here hadn't really identified the decision-making aspect that was involved, or who the intended audience was. They hadn't found particularly good sets of statistics which really made the message clear. And in comparison with these ones here, had really not told a clear story. So those two up here from CFI had basically got to grips with what the problem was, showing it clearly, identifying the audience, and then making some sort of story become quite clear. And so these ones are need to be thinking about what was the real question. Think about, did I actually answer the question in what I submitted, which was entered <coughs> in those posters there. Because that's going to become really, really important as you develop into the next stage, which you should be working on real hard now, is starting to lay out the plan and constructing the outline of your article that you're going to write about, which is probably going to be related to the topic in some way that was the subject of your poster. Now, one of the interesting differences, I think, between the two groups is that IT have been concentrating over the last couple of years on identifying an interesting story that they're then going to research and then write about in a very, very focused way. So we've been push looking at, in IT, a lot about the skills, the soft skills of problem identification, problem understanding, researching, analyzing, critical thinking, and then putting it all together as a clear, persuasive story that convinces the reader. And this is something you guys as CFI uh, graduates are going to find really really important because if you all go into the forensic, computer forensics investigations field you're continually going to be getting interesting problems thrown at you or you may just get here's something's happened find out what's happened the problem identification and then you are going to have to construct a really clear storyline of what the data the reasons you've done the project in the slightly more than I was given the project to do by my boss that's not the kind of most helpful but you've got to give the story behind why that problem was given to you and then how you chose the right technical tools to do with the, the relevant analysis and but much, much, much more importantly is then how do you put together those words, that set, set, state, stage by stage explanation of what that, those ana, uh, analytics and analyses are proving. Could be proving that him over there or her over there has done some, you know, been fid f f um, fiddling the accounting system. If you're doing accounting forensics through computing mechanisms, or if you're looking at um, firewall data or intrusion detection systems, or ev evaluating a hard drive image that you've got with NCase or something. At all stages, you've done at a technical level very competent work. The thing that will make you highly employable is when you can take that all 
and say, what this really means, in the context of this problem I've identified, this is step by step what it all means and wh who is involved. And this is really what, to me, having looked at all 25 or so, 30 um, posters that are covered here, that's the difference between that side and there. That side tells the story. This side isn't clear on the story. And that tells me we've got some work to do in the workshops with your draft articles over the next three, four weeks, where I can help you focus on moving your storytelling, your communication <coughs> skills, the structuring and the telling the story and find, working out how to make it really compelling that will move you all from here into that level there. Now one other thing to help you with is that if we get all of these up to, if we move everybody one whole band that way, which means we'll have a small number, a couple of people perhaps in the 60s band and everybody in the 70s, the 80s and maybe one or two in the 90s band, that is not going to get scaled by the external examiner. Because I've been doing the sort of assessments now that you've got here with those sort of criteria that you can see against the article, and they are agreed by our external examiner as being pretty solid. Because they're connected to external factors, external things that we are, we can relate to in terms of publishing quality. It's not like some of the um, university level ones which say suitable or good or very good at level six, which is kind of, hmm? doesn't really mean much, does it? Good at level six. Whereas what you've got for, not so much for this one, but these are good, but for the article, they are solidly, in a sense, objective criteria. And so don't worry if we're, as we push them up, to say, let's see, it has happened on other modules, the whole band can be moved back down here by the external application. But they don't do that to this module. So I want you lot to start working with me and let me work with you <coughs> to move you all across at least one grade band. Luke? For the external uh, markers, is it a case of university lecturers final word of what goes and they kind of advise you? The external moderation process, external examiner process, first of all is the external kind of agrees that the, uh, the assessments are at the right level, the right sort of criteria. Then you do the work, we mark it, some, a colleague will then uh, sample, typically it's either f uh, whichever's the greater of the square root of the number of assignments submitted, or five, whichever is larger. So it'll be for this module six, because I think we've just got a bit over 25. And they will then be, yeah, they, either they're marked according to the criteria, the criteria fair and appropriate, and then that same sample goes off to the external. Now the external's role primarily is to ensure that the moderation, the internal moderation process and marking have been done according to the criteria. Very, very rarely, the external will also um, look at the overall grade profile and say, I don't believe that, it's not reasonable, it has to be shifted back so it's centered on 65, a bit like the blue one. Or centered somewhere between this, around about the 60%. The external will also look at the sample and make sure, yeah, that, that that grade does look about right. It is actually fair and consistent between across universities. So the external examiners also take a perspective from their home institution and say, yeah, and maybe if they've got a second external examinership, then they will also say, okay, so uh, I'm starting to work up for Stafford, uh, Salford University. How do Derby and Salford grade profiles compare? Are the criteria kind of sensibly uh, at level five or level six or level four or at master's level? 
And so it provides some sort of consistency between different universes and different disciplines. So it ensures that the processes are operated fairly so that you're getting the right grade that is actually reflect the sort of level of work, the quality of the work you're doing, not the amount of work. Who cares about amount? It's the quality. Which is why we're looking, you can see in the um, definitions of the criteria for the article, they're, they are written as they are. They provide some, some quite interesting um, robustness to the criteria compared to some of the more traditional good. I mean, if, if you remember when you guys first started, you probably saw grave uh, descriptors like good or satisfactory, good, very good, and excellent. Do you remember those days? Yeah. How do you connect that to anything that you can really understand? And so what I've been working on is to actually make those much clearer and much more focused and provide that robustness by the, that presentation. So that's 75% is a local publishing or suitable for publication at a local uh, research seminar, university one say. 85% is a national quality um, seminar or workshop or conference. And the 95% is publishable at an international quality research uh, conference workshop. But this view is quite rare between the uni and the external examiners. On my modules, I have never had a dispute. Not in the last four or five years. I don't remember ever having one before then either. Mm. But there are occasionally ones which are more associated with the good, very good, excellent, where it's suddenly you've got no justification for having it centred up at 75 or 80 percent. Move them all, scale them all back. Never happened on the criteria that I'm using, or and other colleagues are using as well. I mean, Olga, remember Olga? Yeah, she used the same sort of criteria occasionally, if I remember correctly. We, we developed it together, and that it, the externals very much have liked it and are very happy with whatever distribution turns up, especially when, even when it turns up skewed right off to the right hand side. So, basically, reassurance to you guys, particularly you guys from CFI that if you get up here, you aren't in danger of having to move back again. Now, now that we've talked about that, do you, you all, and I'm not going to focus on whether you're CFI or IT, if you think back to those posters you looked at last week in Mark, do you begin to feel that, yes, that probably was the right explanation about lack of focus and lack of clear uh, audience and so on? So now you can do, now you can take up take that message on board with your articles, can't you? Okay. Lovely. But I mean, I have to say, the fact that we've got nobody down here is amazingly good. I think you've done, all of you have done really, really well. I'm really very pleased with what you've done overall. I'd have liked to have got that one up into there, but that was... Um, <coughs> That was a little bit tricky to cope with at that level. I couldn't have done much more with that one. So just one below a good 2122 and first is a really fabulous result. So that's what you all want, isn't it? First or 2-1. Let's see if we can get most of it in the article across to there. Okay, folks, well done. Now, what I want to do now is, because it's particular, I'm not going to look at the presentation <laughs> sections, uh, PowerPoints for last week and um, this week, the main um, ISO 27002 stuff. You can go and have a look at that yourselves. It's probably worthwhile having a look at it. ISO 27002 is a really excellent information governance, security and assurance standard from, um, from the ISO. Any of you come across it before? It's published by the um, International Standards Organization, ISO, as a, an information security and assurance um, standard. It's part of a set of about 10 or 15 standards, all about different aspects of information security and assurance. How to do it. 
it's what we, we typically call the ISO 27K series. Now, there's a lot in there. The mo ISO 27001 is the one you will hear a lot about because that is the processes and procedures for de being able to demonstrate that you do ISO 27001. And that you can keep people's information secure if you're taking on board other people's stuff. Uh, it has a whole lot of procedures about all sorts of things. But it's fairly heavyweight, but you can get a certification. And for some types of business work, you need to have ISO 27001 certification. But it's a very, very tick boxy process, hard work. 27002, however, is rather more interesting. It is actually, in 10 to 12 chapters, a set of really interesting questions that you, as an organization, can ask yourself to work out what you need to do to, to maintain good quality, integrity of your data, security of your data, and all sorts of things based on a really, really important point, which is that you start off from a risk assessment of your business. And the IC27002 allows you to scale from yourself as an individual, a consultant, where the risk, you, your biggest risk, actually turns out to be that or your laptop because you have got all of your contact details and all sorts of other stuff on there. You've also got to um, maintain legality in terms of your sort of revenue, tax and revenue position so you've got to keep records a certain amount of time and, and there may be another one. So the first thing is highest risk, loss of that, back it up. Second highest risk probably is everything you got on one of those, your hard drive, your portable hard drive, back it up, multiple locations. Tax, accounting, get an accountant to do it, he'll look after your records for the statutory seven years or whatever, so you don't have to worry about I mean, a sort of fire safe in your home or so on. At the other end, ISO 27002 allows you to scale to companies big as Rolls-Royce Aerospace. Rolls Royce PLC, 30, 40, 50,000 staff. Very, very scalable. So that's what the other presentations are. What I want to look at today comes back to some much more interesting stuff, which is what we could think about is governance in terms of big data analytics. And because we're looking at big data, the Internet of Things, the way that we're collecting vast amounts of data. And for example, one of our, your colleagues here, in here, found some interesting data for a module last semester with something like 48 million rows of data. Now it's beginning to feel quite large. You've got to do some fascinating things with your data before you can even analyze it. So we're really looking at some quite interestingly large stuff, and you could be getting to that as well, or thinking about it. You can, do you know how to get at, by the way, you guys in CFI, how to get at the ISO standards or the British standards? You do. If you go into UDO, and then go to the library, and you go to is it the A to Z, yeah. yeah, you'll see under B, British Standards Organisation, BSO. You click on there, and as long as you're in the university, it will just go through and you'll go straight in, and you'll be able to get access to every single British standard or ISO standard that's published, plus a lot of other supporting documentation. And you have that ability, actually, if you follow the instructions a little bit carefully, from home, or through your laptop or whatever. And bear in mind, the standards don't change that quickly if I have a look at my ISO 27002 2013, in essence, it's pretty similar to the ISO standard 20, uh, 27002 2005. Not a lot of change. If you are a student, you have access to all of them for free. If you go in as a member of the public, they typically cost you about £50 per each. And there are, uh, what you probably want to do, just out of interest while you're here, 
um, is have a look into ISA, the British standards online and see what sort of standards there are that relate to the sort of things you're interested in doing. And you will find lots and lots of standards. You guys have found lots of standards, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Business continuity standards, that's 25999. Pro the, these security governance ones, 27,000 series from 27,000 to, I think it's about 27,000 and about 20 or 30 now, with a few gaps. So get hold of some of those, see what they tell you. What I wanted to look at today particularly is some interesting words beginning with V, that's whether you look at it as 12 or 14, that allow you to ask some rather interesting questions about this stuff called big data, the stuff that's coming from the internet of things, from social networks, inside corporations, their terabytes, petabytes of uh, data that they've collected from wherever. And now I want to actually look at, well, okay, so there's them, there's them, and what's it all mean, pulling it all together? Now, the latest version of ISO 27002 has these various sections, starting off with your policies, um, how you organize information security, but then, more interestingly, the, the next chapter start posing interesting questions about your human resources. Think about what happened at Target in, the, in America two years ago, a year and a half ago, when a contractor came in to work on the infrastructure and had been prevailed upon to have a, some malware on the uh, memory stick that was put into the system with proper authorization uh, that then took over the <coughs> allow the exfiltration of huge numbers of credit card details. Whether it's from the peer points of sale tills or whether it's from the master systems, it's still not clear to me exactly what the story was. But lots of interesting questions there and approaches you should take to, or should think about taking to make sure that the humans in your organizations, your employer, employees, the subcontractors and so on, can't cause you a problem. How to look after the assets, which could be, well, particularly to do with information assets, could be paper, could be electronic information, could be all sorts of stuff, all sorts of ways. And it goes down through all of these levels. Well, I'm not going to spend time doing it, but if you're interested, these are all interesting sets of questions. This, each chapter is quite a long one. They typically have 20, 30 subsections, each of which are really valuable, really important uh, questions you need to ask yourself. What sits behind all of this are the three pillars of 27,000. Risk assessment is the first pillar. The second one is the obligation of a company to um, comply with all external legal obligations, whether it's laws, regulations, statutes, and all the other stuff that pours out of the world, things also like contracts. If you have a contract with a third party, you must obey it. And I remember a lovely situation, or hearing of an interesting situation where a company had, was changing from one set of legacy systems to a new ERP system, and the project had been scoped out and it would cover this, whatever this was. And then, about so a year before go live, a manager popped out of the woodwork saying, um, I've got this contractual obligation to provide this analysis. I need it to be specified. I need to have that data that's extracted from this new ERP system and made available to this reporting system, which I'm con legally and contractually obliged to report on a quarterly basis project team kind of looked at themselves and looked at the manager and said, out of scope. And the guy said, hang on, why is it out of scope? I have a contractual obligation. They just said, well, you know, it wasn't something we knew about when we scoped the whole project, so we don't have the money to do it, so it's out of scope. Read my lips, out of scope. A few circles round that sort of miscommunication, M M said manager retired hurt. Three months later, pop back out of the woodwork, I have a legal obligation, I've got a contractual obligation, we've got to do it. 
same out of scope. And what happened, the story never tells what actually happened in the end. Presumably someone found some money sometime to produce the interface to do it, because no, the people who had that contract were going to hold them to that contract, quite clearly in that, this particular case. So, second pillar of ISO 27002 is compliance with external obligations. The third pillar of all of this is compliance with your own internal policies and procedures. So if we have a policy, you must also ensure your organisation complies with it. And if you look at what's happened with, um, <clears throat> with that huge oil blowout in the Gulf a few years ago, that particular company, the, the oil company who owned that well, were getting well drilled, had policies about how things should be done. And they'd also got certification that they had all sorts of environmental processes and procedures in place. Interestingly, over the preceding 10 years, most oil companies, and that oil company as well, had been fined fairly vigorously by the environmental protection agencies around the world for failing to actually comply with their internal policies in terms of environmental protection. The oil well that blew up was they had policy in place or procedure in place that should have ensured that never happened. However, there were internal <coughs> pressures that said, look, we can't take the time, we can't afford the extra $10 million to do it properly, or $50 million, I forget the precise number. So we will cut a whole load of corners. We will not comply with our internal policies and procedures. And we all know what happened, they had a huge blowout which took quite a few months to cap, staggering quantities of oil drifted around the Gulf and all onto the southern coast of the states, and for saving, let's say it's $50 million at the worst to have done that drip, um, well properly, it cost them nearly $50 billion in fines and reparations, and nearly destroyed the company, because they didn't comply with their internal procedures. And this is really what sits behind all of this lot, um, those three pillars. Right? Risk assessment. What are the most important risks to your specific business? Not general business, but your specific business. You as an individual consultant, you as a company doing forensics or consultancy or whatever. And these give you some interesting ideas of the things you need to do. So that's the basis of governance. And in fact, if I when I talked to the um, to people from British Standards Organisation itself, they would much have preferred ISO 20, what now is ISO 27002, to be called information governance, not information security. But the international pressures turned it into, into um, information security. But it's all about how to do the right thing with your data and your systems, develop the systems, implement the systems, maintain the systems there how to work with your suppliers, make sure they do the right things as well, they don't provide a source of vulnerability to you, and so on. So that's the, the major international policy framework. Now move forward to this thing called big data. Now back in about 2002-03, Gartner came up with the first three Vs of big data. And these are used to define what big data was about. That it was defined by one or more of those three in terms of the volume, the size, and to be true big data, it was bigger than we know how to cope with with existing software and infrastructure. And we're now getting to level, and when they first started, that would have been in the petabytes sort of size. Today, you're moving up to the exabyte size, to the data, data sizes we're getting, having a bit of difficulty coping with. The second one was V for velocity. It's coming at us so fast that we can't process it quickly enough to gain the insights, the understanding that we need to get, um, and so we're being overwhelmed with data. The third one was interesting. This is variety, and by that they mean classically companies dealt with their SQL databases, or something like that. 
and it would be basically numbers and text. And yeah, it might be formatted in clear or it might be binary coded. What became interesting when we started collecting big data in the early 2000s was suddenly it wasn't just the corporate database. It was all of these big binary large objects or blobs and so on, uh, could have been, uh, but also unstructured data, huge quantities of text. Today we're looking at a big source of data uh, which is unstructured, things like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all of those sort of things where it has no real format. It's just kind of, for Twitter, up to 140 bytes. With rubbish spelling, no grammar, no syntax, but humans can understand it. Machines find it hugely difficult to, to read the, and understand and interpret the sort of text sources. Then, a couple of years later, IBM came up with a fourth V, which is really more of a, a question, V for value, to try and sort of make the point there's no point in doing this analytics unless it adds value to your business, maybe to your customer, or maybe to you. And that really where it stalled until a couple of years ago, um, around about this time of year, yeah, week seven, week six in this module. We started with your predecessors looking at, okay, we've got three definitional ones, we've got a question one, what else? can we think about that will help us to understand some of the governance questions about big data? And so we kind of brainstormed and came up with about nine at the end of the session. And then we did the same again last year and ended up with another three or four. <coughs> so we got about somewhere between 12 and 14 Vs. But what we also discovered, which is rather interesting, was that these three, which Gartner presented it a long way back, 13 years ago roughly, as a de defining these, they also actually ask, allow you to ask your own interesting questions about the context of your use of big data. So volume, okay, how big is it? What are the consequences? And they could lead you to decisions about whether you use SQL type tables or it could lead you to columnar type uh, column based databases or row based databases or NoSQL databases, whatever. Just by looking at asking questions caused by the volume you've got flowing through, uh, the volume and the variety. So they could lead you to ask interesting questions. And the point about governance is really, governance is more about asking sensible questions so that you can do the right thing in the right way, to the right quality, at the right time, and as many of those right things as you want to add in. <coughs> then we start looking at the other Vs, variability. If you remember, one of the things that drives big data analysis is statistics. Whether you're looking at Cognos BI, whether you're looking at SAS, whether you're looking at R, whether you're looking at Tableau, Click, ClickView, all of the analytics tools essentially are pre presenting the patterns in your data. And most of the work is done by using very, very clever statistical techniques. And statistics is rooted in what happened in the past. And the variability, the temporal variability, is yeah, we've got these ideas, we've got these data at this point in time. And a good example are likes in social media. A fundamental assumption tends to be that if a person likes this thing, there's a correlation that says they will like this thing as well. And that might be true for a period of time. And then suddenly, because we're human, we change, that relationship breaks down. And I made this suddenly, you know, I no longer like whatever it is. Think about food. For a while, we like apples, and then we go off apples and start eating strawberries, and then we move on to apricots or whatever. 
So there's a temporal variability. We change our preferences, we change our likes. And if we don't ask that question, we're going to make some invalid assumptions about constancy. That once I've registered that I like apples, that's going to be the same for all time. Is it really? One of the biggest problems with big data, when it comes to the Internet of Things, social media feed, even our corporate databases, would you believe it, we don't actually know how much of our data is actually correct, whatever that means. And we don't know, we can't identify the data which is incorrect, and we can't identify by how much that data is incorrect either. And when I first saw these statistics, which came from a guy called John Easton at IBM, he published it in 2012, I thought, ah, oh, well, <coughs> the way he showed the, the diagram, it looked as though corporate data was the bottom 10, 15%, and that was obviously the stuff that was actually certain veracity. And then I thought back, no, actually that's not the case, because when companies take migrate all of their sys legacy systems into something like SAP or other ERP systems, they go on a massive data cleansing exercise and get rid of something like 60-70% of their data before they transfer that 30% of clean data into the new system. What's become interesting, looking at some companies who've done that sort of exercise, in less than five years, maybe ten, well, somewhere between five and ten years, they suddenly discover that, that what was clean data at the implementation of that ERP system is now contaminated by all sorts of rubbish. And they have to do another data cleansing exercise. So it proves that even corporate data is not part of data we can be absolutely certain of its veracity. And that, of course, for you, for, if you're doing forensic analysis, it's kind of important that you have a feel for is the data likely to be accurate data that we can truly trust, or are we trying to find out which is the incorrect data, the false data, what are we trying to do? So veracity becomes an incredibly important governance question as you do a lot of forensics investigation. Validity, kind of related to veracity, but it's just a kind of provability game. Can you prove that this is correct? How do you prove that your passport <coughs> is correct. How do you prove your identity? Today, in Britain, it's considered you've proven your identity if you have a passport with your photo in, recent. You've got a bank statement with your address on or some other public service sort of thing that's gone to your address. Uh, maybe your driving license, the paper part of it, if you've got one. Um, a few other things like that. If you think about when we were th the government was wanting to us to have a biometrics-based identity card, they were going to put, you're going to get your biometrics put into this thing in a beautifully encrypted form, which was claimed to be uncrackable, and they would then, mostly, when you put this thing to, along with you, they would, you'd just put it into a reader, it would read your card and say, yeah, your face on the car in the biometric store looks like your face that we just got through the camera there. There was going to be a very interesting situation arising if they'd gone down that road much further, because they never, or very, very rarely, were going to check your photo, sorry, your face, if it's biometric, biometric based, with the card, that's stored on the card, that was stored on the central master database. Only very occasionally would they go back to the master database version, at which point, if you'd got, somehow cracked it and substituted your face on with my ID card, which was technically going to be likely at some stage, only when it was then connected back to the master database, randomly once a year perhaps, would they detect that card isn't correct? The question then was going to arise, someone's got a clone of my card with their biometrics on it, not mine, how can we prove who we are? Would that bring back to the master?
master data or something. They didn't have a master database version somewhere totally protected. You, I would have huge problem proving that that was that I'm me. It's getting more and more difficult these days as well, by the way. And then we have things like volatility, which is how long does that data uh, last for? How long does it actually retain validity and veracity? Verbosity is really reminding that if you're dealing with text, machine text analysis is a very uncertain thing because humans understand text. We understand faces very well, so when we're face to face, we can understand what's going on. If we're dealing through text only, it gets difficult. If someone starts typing in um, uppercase the whole thing, we know we've, we feel we've been flamed, don't we? We feel that someone who just uses uppercase all the time is angry rather than just ignorant. Now when we get on to something like visualization, now ask questions about, okay, so we've got this vast amount of data, we've crunched it down, we've clustered it, we've done this, we've done some predictives on it, so we're looking forward into the future a little bit. Ask lots of questions where ethics comes in big time. How, many, how often do you notice that someone's provided a graph where the zero is missing? You've only got between, say, 85 and 95 on the, left, on the x-axis, and it looks like a mountain. And if you put the full odd zero, you see it'll find wobbly like that. People choose the scales, they choose the way they present the data to maximize the impact of their message, the story they want to tell. You've seen those false origins and choosing log scales to hide uh, big changes. Lots of different leads. Lots of different questions that allow you to ask how are you as a company, or as an organization, or as a person, get value to somebody one of your stakeholders from your exercise. Because remember, 60% of all big data IoT analytics projects fail or are challenged and do not deliver the planned benefits to the organization. Exactly this, or almost exactly the same sort of level of challenge and failure as the Standish Group have been reporting for. 20 years now. And if you ask these sort of questions, ask the 27,002 type questions, think about the risk assessment and so on, risk management, there's a little bit of a chance that you may have a more successful experience of using uh, your big data to get good uh, analytics driven decision making. And the 10, 12 questions we have across the two modules cover a whole range of aspects that an organization needs to think about if big data analytics is going to be of value to them. So that's why we've been, I wanted to look at this. So what do you then have to think about? And these really will come back to haunt you as you plan your article. How do these two sets of questions, of guidelines, interact so that the people that you are writing for in your articles, your target audience, will discover that there's lots of things they didn't know about all of this lot, big data driven analytic or big data analytics driven uh, decision making. will need at least thinking about that lot. <coughs> Part of the way you'll do that is to think about, well, are there common themes between the questions in there and the questions there, or the questions behind them? Which will lead you some, top, some ideas about connecting them up together and then providing some really, really good advice to the people out there who are thinking about using the Internet of Things or data from the Internet of Things, data from big data in general, to try and do something really great, to actually help people. Whether, you know. And the problem is, 
if you think about all of this lot, and then think about what people are actually doing with big data at the moment, they get huge data sets, and then they use statistics to find the correlations. But as we all know, correlation doesn't mean anything. The thing that's important, ultimately, is causation. Which key things cause something to happen? Yesterday, our Chancellor said, oh, I changed the tax rules in 2012 and reduced the higher rate of tax from 50% to 45%. And look what happened in 2013-14. I got 8 billion more income. So by change, reducing the tax rate, I get people to pay more tax. Correlation of a sort. Other answers, and this is where something I've been reading recently, the last couple of three days, where's the little data that gives the insight? The little data says, well, actually, what happened was, and this is a supposition, it's not been tested yet, was that people heard in 2012 that the tax rate is going to drop by 5%. And it is thought, or known perhaps in some cases, that people who were going to be subject to that reduction said, well, I will put my invoice in to get my payment in the next tax year, so I shall move my claim for my income from... 2013 tax year to 2014, so I pay it at a lower rate. So people that delayed must have been <coughs> 8 billion, 16 billion, probably about 19, 20 billion worth of income. They moved from 2013, sorry, 2012 13 to 2013 14. So if that is the case, the Chancellor didn't actually correlate and get an increase in revenue. Actually, his total take probably went down by 5%, which is kind of about a billion, a billion and a half, two billion perhaps, over that time scale, because they all moved it into the next year. Or correlation, apparently, there's quite a good correlation between people who smoke and their risk of getting murdered. <laughs> total artifact. Or there's an even better one. Um, the number of tons of fresh lemons which are imported into the USA from Mexico every year correlates <coughs> almost perfectly with an R of 0.99, I think it was, which is absolutely perfect correlation with an road traffic deaths in the USA. <laughs> and if you go and search for these correlation uh, statistics, you'll find a website, or several websites, with lots and lots of these totally spurious correlations, where there is absolutely no chance of a correlation. It just... And so, again, this comes into big data-driven or big data analytics driven decision-making is lots of good, co interesting correlation, but unless you get at what's really going on, finding that real causality, you're going to get lost. And if you're working with statistics which are based on the past and you project them into the future, you are relying on the future being the same as the past. And we know that that's not necessarily the case. And another example here is that for the last 50 years, every 10 years, the macroeconomic models of the world have broken. And then they've been rebuilt and they work for the next 10 years. What is really interesting and rather scary is that the, that the last known macroeconomic models that worked failed in about 2007, 2008. And nobody has properly been able to reconstruct those macroeconomic models that tell governments how the economies work. We don't know what's going on now. But we've lost those models. Be because today is too different from the past. And so predictive analytics, which is a great big thing today, as long as things don't change, you can see a little bit into the future, but not very far. So lots of interesting things, lots of interesting questions. How are we going to use those in coming up with a really interesting and powerful article that gets you into that band I was showing you there? Okay, folks, that helped you. I'll see you downstairs in due time. Before you finish, I've got a bit clipped. <laughs>